Coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter Podcast. I was out on a boat at the 4th of July at a friend's lake house, and I had a little itch behind my ear, so I scratched, and I felt a lump, and I was like, hmm, that's weird, and it didn't go away for a few weeks, so I went into the doctor and was like, hey, I've got this lump behind my ear, I don't know what it is, and it's not going away, so he thought it was a cyst, but when he went to look at it, he realized it was solid, and he removed it, and so I got diagnosed with Sark at that time. Leanne West is a scientist at Georgia Tech, but long ago she made a personal discovery. She had sarcoidosis. It is attacking my lungs, liver, lymph nodes, and spleen, but the main place I have symptoms is in the lungs. Coming up, Leanne West shares her story and talks about how she's helping all of us in the fight against sarcoidosis. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome. This is episode 76 of the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. This episode of the podcast brought to you by Kind Advanced Sciences. For more information about their Resolve Lung Clinical Trial, please visit www.sarcoidosistrial.com and there will be more information and a link in the show notes. You hear me say this, but it's worth repeating. I do this podcast because I want to offer my fellow Sark fighters hope to help you connect with other Sark patients. Even if you don't ever talk to them, at least you know they're out there. Hear their stories, understand how sarcoidosis is affecting their lives. And what I'm trying to do is help paint the landscape so you can navigate through your life, see what you're up against, whether it's the disease, whether it's the medicine or both, and to be able to to just just see how other people have made it through and to let you know what you're really up against and then you can make good decisions as you go through your life. I want to remind everybody that FSR has launched something called the Ignore No More Act Now, which is Advanced Clinical Trials for Equity and Sarcoidosis Campaign. Basically, this is to raise awareness of racial health disparities with a focus on increasing representation of black sarcoidosis patients in clinical trials. So clinical trials, as you know, are these tests where new medications uh, are eventually coming to the point where they can do tests with real humans. They've gotten it out of the lab. They've proven that it's safe. And now they want to see uh, what sort of outcomes the drugs have when it comes to real people. And there are more sarcoidosis patients in the black community than there are in the white community, and yet there are fewer black patients signing up for and participating in these clinical trials. And so FSR sees that disparity, and they're trying to fix it. That's what the Ignore No More campaign is about, and there's more information and a link in the show notes. Also, I want to let you know that FSR is looking for Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance volunteers. That's a lot to take in, but basically, FSR has gone back to the drawing board. They have reformed relationships with those hospitals and care centers that uh, really know what they're doing and specialize in sarcoidosis. And so when you put all of those hospitals, if you will, or care centers or clinics together, all of them together are now known as the Global Sarcoidosis Alliance. So it's an alliance of hospitals. Think of it like that. And then they need volunteers at each of those centers who will become community outreach leaders, who will work with the, to share their sarcoidosis stories with the public, and then essentially empower others and raise awareness, Uh, or you can apply to be a support group leader uh, who will work with teams of two to facilitate in-person support group meetings 
at these clinic alliance member locations. And, and so basically, they're, they're looking for different types of volunteers at each of these facilities. And, and you'll be the public volunteer outreach when it comes to sarcoidosis. So if you are motivated to really help, this is a great way to do it. And I'll put a link in the show notes. And you can maybe become a part of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance. All right, you know, we talk a lot about how SARC impacts our lives, and all of us, you know, we want to keep the disease at bay so that we can have the experiences that we think about, whether you've got children or grandchildren or significant other, and, you know, there's going to be a wedding or there's going to be a graduation or there's going to be one of these life events, and you want to be there and you want to be there in some sort of um, being able to in- enjoy it because you, you don't want the disease or the medications messing with you. And so whenever you get an opportunity to do something like that, you consider that a win. Uh, people without sarcoidosis might just take all those things in stride, but when you've got SARC, you've got to you've got to look at these things and you've got to say, I have SARC and I still did this and I accomplished it. And that's one of the reasons that I want to keep fighting. So when you see me on Instagram and I post a picture of something that I've just done that I enjoyed or, or a picture of me you know, with a grandchild or whatever it is, I always put in there, keep fighting. And, and the keep fighting is because um, that's, that's why, right? Uh, and because sarcoidosis is... A, an illness that most of us can come to terms with at some point and at some level and adopt a new normal and then, and then enjoy our successes and recognize those successes for what they are. I had the chance to do one of those things a couple of weeks ago. My sons gave me tickets for my birthday to go to the Virginia Tech football game. I'm a huge Hokie fan. That's the name of the Virginia Tech uh, teams is, is they're the Virginia Tech Hokies. For the record, nobody knows what a Hokie is, but um, if you watch sports at all, you've, you've heard that because, you know, the, the Tech teams have done quite well in basketball and football and some of the more visible sports over the years. So uh, the idea was is that I and my three sons uh, would go and enjoy the game, and they bought tickets for the front row on the 50-yard line. Um, and this was going to be, you know, just a just a great day, uh, all four of us to go. And I, I guess I don't know if I mentioned, but I taught news writing at Virginia Tech for over a decade. And my son, my oldest son, Jonathan, uh, graduated from Virginia Tech. And we have, you know, we've just been as a family, big tech fans. So then my middle son, Ben, got covid and my other son, Tyler, uh, has a new job, and he didn't want to be exposed to those of us who had been with Ben, so he opted not to go. He's got small children. He can't, he can't really get sick and miss work right now. So it turns out that it's just my oldest son, Jonathan, and I going to the game. So we decided we would bring his son, my oldest grandson, Luke, who is four years old. Uh, by the time you listen to this, he might have turned five, but you get the idea. And so this would be Luke's first big time college football game. And, you know, Virginia Tech is big time. They're in the ACC and there's I think the stadium seats 66,000 people. And it's you know, it's a big deal. You're going to a major sporting event. So uh, we took Luke and we walked around through all the tailgates and he's looking around wide eyed. And then it was a big treat for me. We walked into the merch tent and I bought him a, a hoodie, a little tiny hoodie, and he looked so cute in it, uh, and a little foam football and a foam finger for, you know, kid size, the one that you put up that says, you know, we're number one. So I bought him a foam finger and just got him all this merch, and he got the bag, and he's walking around with it, and then there was different things for kids to do, uh, that you know, the pregame stuff. So, so we walked around, and, and he just enjoyed that. Then we got in the stadium, and it's loud, right? I mean, it, it, the band is playing and the the speakers are blaring. And one of the big things that Virginia Tech does is the team runs out to the sounds of uh, the Metallica song, Enter Sandman. And everybody in the stadium gets up and jumps up and down. And that is a Virginia Tech tradition. And it just really gets in your veins and, and your heart pounds. And it's it's just absolutely wonderful. Well, Luke 
absolutely hated it. <laughs> it was too loud for him. And he kind of curled up. He was like, Daddy, I don't like this. You know, and it just got louder and louder. And then uh, one of the things that they do is they have the uh, Corps of Cadets. And right before the game starts, they shoot a cannon. And, of course, that was loud. But by the end of the first quarter, Luke settled in. He got used to it. And being on the front row, when the band would come by, they would high-five everybody reaching over. And so he got high-fives. And uh, it was it was just, it, was a, it turned out to be an amazing day. Uh, even though Virginia Tech lost in the fourth quarter, Georgia Tech came from behind and, and beat us by a point. Um, the Tech's... It, the Hokies are having a terrible season anyway. It's the first year they won't go to a bowl since the 1990s. Um, new coach, good coach, but uh, uh, he kind of hasn't didn't get a chance to recruit his players or his you know implement his system. So um, it was more about Luke than it was the game. That's that's a long way of saying that. I apologize. But speaking of Georgia Tech today. Leanne West is joining us, and she's a fellow SARC patient. She also serves with me on the FSR Patient Advisory Committee, uh, but she works at Georgia Tech. In fact, Leanne's list of professional accomplishments literally goes on for pages. I think it's, it's like eight pages long, her resume. But I can tell you that she's a principal research scientist at Georgia Tech. She has a master's you talk about smart, a master's in engineering science and one in applied physics. And she is the president of something called the Children's Advisory Network, which is something else, which is kind of tangential to the Georgia Tech role. But I'll just read you a bit of her bio. Her research research includes remote sensing, sensor development, mobile health applications, and algorithm development. In her 25 years working at Georgia Tech, she has led multi-million dollar programs and teams of researchers to develop products for government and industry partners. She also started her own company, Intelligent Access, to make her invention of a wireless personal captioning system go to market. She serves as the technical liaison between Georgia Tech and the children's hospitals all around the world with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and Shriners Hospitals for Children being the main partners. Ms. West works closely with clinicians to understand and identify problems that need a solution to allow them to take better care of their patients. And I'll just continue here just briefly, but I mean, and this is just literally just scratching the surface of her accolades. Um, Leanne is an expert in patient engagement and serves as the first patient of the International Children's Advisory Network called ICANN that was brought to the U.S. in 2014, and they foster greater global understanding about the importance of pediatric patients and the caregiver voice in healthcare, clinical trials, and research, and recognizing that pediatric patients are the experts when it comes to their healthcare, ICANN gives its members the opportunities to share their stories and experience experiences in front of big organizations, including the FDA and the CDC, and at national and international conferences, including the International Society for Pediatric Innovation and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So big time stuff. And then, as I mentioned, Leanne is a patient advocate for FSR, and she is also on the uh, Speakers Bureau as well. So Leanne goes around the country and and talks uh, in non-COVID times about sarcoidosis and lets people know what's going on. And today, she's going to let us know what's going on. And I think you'll want to hear her personal story about dealing with sarcoidosis next here on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. I feel like a zombie just feeding at stumbling. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. 
Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. Welcome back to the Sark Fighter Podcast. Joining me now is Leanne West from the state of Georgia. Yep. Welcome this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. So you're a fellow Sark fighter, and let's just get it right out there. Where Where is Sark attacking you? Yep. It is attacking my lungs, liver, lymph nodes, and spleen. But the main place I have symptoms is in the lungs. Wow. And And you just shared with me that you are suffering a bit of a flare even as we speak. Yes, I am. So I apologize in advance if I have to cough. <laughs> okay, so this, so that's it's showing up in your lungs. It is. Yes, it's definitely showing up in my lungs. And I just started on prednisone this morning, and I'm very unhappy about that because I hate yeah. being on it. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be unhappier later, I think. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you're, just, you're just anticipating how unhappy you're going to be. I, I know. I've put right. it off for a week now, just because I just did not want to go on it, and I. Right. I knew I had to. <laughs> all right. So so since we're all suffering with with prednisone issues, uh, you know, I mean, we all kind of that's the burden that all of us in the Sark space have shared. What um, do you get the moon face? Yes, definitely get the moon face. It is. It's terrible. When I was first really sick, when I was first diagnosed like 15 years ago. Yeah. I lost a ton of weight, which is really weird on prednisone. Nobody else does that. But I lost a lot of weight. So I was skinny looking like I was sick, right? Like you could, you could look at me until I was sick, but then I had that huge moon face and it just, is, it's just a bad look. <laughs> I don't oh, like it. <laughs> no, it is a bad look. You know, I've got one of these photo frames in the house that just kind of rotates through all the pictures of, you know, the past, whatever I, whatever I put on there. Right. And so, and occasionally a picture will come up when I have my moon face, you know, yep. two years and I look at it and I'm like, oh, I can't even believe I was walking around. I should have just gone to the bedroom and stayed there till it was <laughs> over, right? I know, exactly. It was terrible. And I do a lot of um, speaking or, you know, in, in publications at Georgia Tech for some of the work that I do. And it just happened that I had a lot of publications during that time. So I am just the big round face and so many pictures that keep appearing even at Georgia Tech. And I'm like, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's it's just not fair. So tell you are the principal research scientist, the chief engineer of pediatric technologies at Georgia Institute of Technology, and you are president of the International Children's Advisory Network. Can you unbundle all of that for us so we know who we're listening to? Yeah, definitely. So my job that pays me is chief engineer of pediatric technology at Georgia Tech. And through that role, I coordinate between clinicians, understanding what problems they have in the clinic and things that they would like to do to take better care of their kids. And I put them together with teams at Georgia Tech who I think can solve those problems. And so basically, I help coordinate the building of medical devices. So that's really exciting and fun. Principal research scientist, that's just a, another layer of you know how long I've been at Georgia Tech. Um, okay. which is a really, really long time. I went to graduate school there and I never left. And then the International Children's Advisory Network is my job that doesn't pay me, but I absolutely love it. What we do at ICANN is we give kids a platform to share their stories about living with a chronic disease or a medication or a device or just about being a kid. And so we put them in um, in front of uh, conferences to talk. We put them in front of the FDA. We record their videos and they're all on our website at ICANN.health. Um, we give them the opportunity to talk with industry and give feedback about educational materials in the healthcare space or um, again, medical devices or a drug they might live with or even look at clinical trials. The protocol before a clinical trial is run, we have our kids give feedback on those to say, I wouldn't do this trial because of X, or yes, that would be okay, or I don't understand this part. Can you make it a little more clear? So um, our kids are age 8 to 18, and again, probably about 90% live with some sort of medical condition themselves. So I love that part of my job. I feel like, you know, they're all kindred spirits to me, and it's just really great to see them wanting to help you know, the next kid who comes after them and also to take back a little bit of control over something that has really controlled their life. Wow. That's, um, 
that is a lot. So, and I can just <laughs> see how happy you are when you're talking about that. So obviously it's, it's meaningful work for you. Absolutely. Definitely. Okay. So then, so you're doing all that. And I just have to say that, uh, you know, I'm looking at you, you were, you kindly sent me um, your biographical sketch, which is sort of a a big resume. Um, And you have done so much. It's like you never have an opportunity to rest, but you're doing all this and you have sarcoidosis. Yeah. so let's go, let's go back. And you said 15 years ago is, is when you were first diagnosed. Yeah, it might be 14. I'm trying to think my child was five years old and now he's 19 okay. um, when I was diagnosed. <clears throat> and I think that was hard for him because he's only really ever known me as being sick. Right. I do love now, though, that he has decided that he wants to do maybe biomedical engineering and or pre-med in college. And I'm super excited about that because, you know, I think he gets that from his experiences. He participated in mm-hmm. ICANN too, even though he doesn't have a condition. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he sees all the different things that I do and thinks it's cool for me to come home and talk about various devices we're building or where they are in the process. So fun things like that. And I know that probably did not answer your question. Now I can't remember what it was. <laughs> no, so, so, um, because I want to get back to like, what are these things that you build? Because I'm just, I'm fascinated. But, but no, the question on the table for the moment is 14 years ago, that's yep. what you, you were trying to figure out how long you had sarcoidosis. Yes. So you're using your son's age to, uh, to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, 14 years ago, what started happening that you felt like something was wrong? Yeah. So, A couple of years before I was really diagnosed because of the cough and had symptoms, I actually got diagnosed when I had zero symptoms. And that was because I was out on a boat at the 4th of July at a friend's lake house and I had a little itch behind my ear. So I scratched and I felt a lump and I was like, "Hmm, that's weird. And it didn't go away for a few weeks. So I went into the doctor and was like, hey, I've got this lump behind my ear. I don't know what it is and it's not going away. So he thought it was a cyst. But when he went to look at it, he realized it was solid and he removed it. And so I got diagnosed with SARC at that time. And that was about two years before I started having symptoms. And so my symptoms, I had a summer cough and it was just the cough. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse until finally I got to the point that I couldn't even attend a meeting at work because if I started to talk, I would just cough. So I went in and they figured out that I had um, SARC and it was active in my lungs. And that's when I started my journey on lots and lots of prednisone and other things until we figured out the, the medications that mostly work for me now. Wow. So the, the, when the doctor pulls this lump out from behind your ear Mm -hmm. and says it's sarcoidosis, no one said, uh, we need to start watching you or we need to, he just, and at the time, it probably was meaningless to you because who's heard of sarcoidosis, right? Right. Yeah. So he was, I was like, well, what is that? And he said, oh, don't worry about it. So many people have it and they don't even ever know that they have it. Um, you know, they maybe find out by accident like you did. And and so I wouldn't even think about it. So, of course, me being younger and a little bit more naive about the medical space than I am now, I thought, okay, well, my doctor says it's no big deal. So I just didn't even think about it. Um, But I wish I had, I wish I had learned more at the time and understood that I needed to watch for something like a cough, or maybe we did need to check me out in other ways to see if I was, you know, active or going to be active or sick or whatever it is. Um, But it is different for me because I had a diagnosis before I was ever sick, whereas a lot of people have symptoms for forever and it takes, you know, years to figure out what they have. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That myself included. So, so then you get this cough. How did they, I mean, did you remember that you had sarcoidosis or did you go to the doctor? Was it the same doctor, like a general practitioner? And they looked back at your records and said, Hmm, we better, better check your lungs for SARC. That's exactly what happened. So he, he looked at my records, saw that I had SARC and he was like, actually before he did that though, he thought I had pneumonia. And so that's what he diagnosed me as. And then um, 
I went back when I still wasn't getting well. And he, that's when he put together the SARC diagnosis. And so it took a minute um, once I actually had it to figure that out. Okay. And and then they started you on prednisone. Very high doses of prednisone. Right. Um, up to like 120 milligrams. Holy cow. That's the most I've heard of. Ex- yes, exactly. And I think um, I love most of my doctors. <clears throat> I will say that that probably was not my best doctor. Um, I did end up going to a lung specialist, a pulmonologist, and they moved me down to like eventually 80 milligrams. And so it took probably four or five years for the, for me to get better. Um, I, so I stayed on like 80 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 20 milligrams, all for like a year each. Um, and they put me on methotrexate for a little bit and methotrexate did not work for me at all. Nothing changed. And I lost most of my hair. So that was really attractive too, with my big moon face. Cause I stayed on prednisone while I was on methotrexate. Wow. And then, um, when I was finally like, I can't stay on methotrexate any longer and it's not working. So after about a year, they put me on laflunamide, which has been my miracle drug. So that's what I live on daily. And that's what mostly keeps it at bay. All right. So say that, say the new one again. Laflunamide. Laflunamide. Mm-hmm. Is there another name for that? Is it a, a common name or is that the clinical name? I, I want to say that might be the common name. I, it does okay. go by another name, but I don't know what it is. Okay. Okay. That, I mean, that's, uh, you know, and, and I'm naive still, um, <laughs> but I talked to a lot of different people about different drugs. That's the first time I've heard anybody bring that one up. It's unusual no. for some reason, but I did uh-huh. meet somebody this summer who was on laflunamide for another condition for uh, arthritis. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never met it. You know, I barely meet people who have sarcoidosis. He didn't have sarcoidosis, but I'd never meet anybody who's been on laflunamide. So that was, you know, interesting this summer. Okay. No side effects from that? No, they have to watch my liver. So apparently it can be really hard on your liver. So far, so good on not having any symptoms in my liver that it's affecting it. Um, And so no other side effects. I mean, truly it has been my miracle drug. It got me off of prednisone, except when I'm in a flare and- Mm -hmm. It's one pill I take once a day. So super easy. Methotrexate, I was on shots and that was terrible because I travel a lot for work. And when I do, I used to have to have random people give me shots, like coworkers who were traveling with me because they were in areas that I couldn't reach. Um, I even had hotel staff one time give me a shot because I had no one. (laughs) Wow. I, cause I was, I did methotrexate for a while. I feel like I was giving myself a shot in my belly. So um, they made me rotate to eight different sites. Hmm. So four of the sites were sites that I could reach my belly, my thigh and my upper arm. And four of the sites were on my backside that I couldn't reach. Um, and so I had to get people to give them to me in different places. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, that's, that's kind of like, you know, oh, hey, by the way, let's go for coffee and I need someone to give me a shot. <laughs> I know. Right? I know. If, <laughs> fortunately, some of the people that I traveled with, I traveled with a lot, so they got used to it. Um, but yeah, it was definitely embarrassing and difficult. My husband also traveled a lot for work, so I had to have neighbors give me shots too when he was traveling and they were in the locations I couldn't reach. Lots of fun to be me. <laughs> wow. So, so you have it in your lungs, but you also have it in other parts of your body. So spleen, where else? Uh, lymph nodes, which was what ended up being the one behind my ear. Um, and I have those all, uh, all over and then um, the liver. And so hopefully I have not had symptoms in the spleen or the liver. Okay. The lymph nodes just get big and tender, but um, I really hope that my liver stays happy. And, and. Even while you're on medication, are you still having these manifestations like in your lymph nodes and the bumps and so that so it's still active in your body? It is. I mean, and like right now, it's active with a cough. So when that happens, when I know that it's being active, I'll go on prednisone to knock it back down and get it back under control. Huh. And you just keep prednisone around the house because you know and you just start taking it when you need it? Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, the, the, the darn thing about prednisone is that it works. Yes. I, I call it the best worst drug ever because yeah. it's amazing at how well it works, but it is horrible to be on because of all the side effects. I mean, I've even had cataract surgery and um, uh, bone loss from prednisone from being mm -hmm. on it high doses for all of those years. Yeah, that's that's a big one that mm -hmm. I, I went to my doctor because I was on 80 milligrams and I don't talk to many folks on the podcast who've had as many as 80 oh. and you were doing 120. Yeah. But I just said, look, you know, I'm, I, I, and I don't know if you're an active, athletic runner, walker, any of those, I walk. you walk, mm -hmm. but I said, look, I can't be having thinning bones. What if I fall off my bike? You yeah, know? <laughs> I, I know. Everything, everything well, right. It, and it's hard to hear, you know, you're in your forties and I feel like I'm my grandmother having cataract surgery and being on Boniva, you know, it, it's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, so how do they find it in your liver? They, it was either a CT scan or a PET scan. And I, it's been so long and that was such a terrible time. I can't remember which one it was, but they, um, they did a pretty extensive scan just to see if they could figure out where it was in my, in my organs. Okay. So they were, they were just sort of preemptively looking, they weren't searching for the, the root cause of a problem then. No. Yes, they didn't. It was it was simply to kind of assess where I was. And, and where do you go to get treatment? The Cleveland Clinic. Oh, you do. Okay, yep. so you go to the same place I do then. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I yeah, didn't yeah. know you went there. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I love them. They are the best hospital. So I live in Atlanta, and there's not anyone here who specializes in it. That I started going to the Cleveland Clinic. But I'll fly in the night before and have my appointment in the morning and they can do blood work and they get the blood work results back immediately. And if I need to talk to somebody else, I'll go grab somebody else. I mean, they're so efficient there. It's amazing. Yeah, I can. I do the same thing. So you fly in because you're farther away than I am. I drive seven hours, but you're south of me in Atlanta. So, yeah. so you fly to Cleveland. Yep. And, and uh, I actually, the, the, you know, they've got that campus there, you know, the Cleveland clinic has its own zip code. Did you know that? I did. Yeah. It's so big. They have their own zip code. And so they've got multiple hotels on the, on the campus and we mm -hmm. always stay at the cheapest one, which is the holiday Inn. Which... I always stay at the one it's connected by a bridge. Like it's just nice. It's ah. right there. It's like literally attached to the hospital. Okay. I'm going to investigate that. Yeah. Um, because I take the shuttle, which is ridiculously easy also. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, okay. So now, now we're getting way inside baseball and the rest of the listeners are like, okay, you know, we, we don't care, <laughs> John and Leanne, which hotel you stay at when you go to the cleaning <laughs> clinic. But um, so so they are, um, are, are watching you closely. Do you go once a year, twice a year? Once a year. Once a year. That's where I'm at. Okay. Okay. Um, and do you see Dr. Manny or who do you see? I see Dr. Culver. Dr. Culver. Oh, you got the big dog. There you go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's like uh, one of the, one of the top sarcoidosis docs in the country whenever you talk to folks. So, um, well, good for you. And I hope they, uh, they keep you straightened out and, and everything works well from there. Now you mentioned before that your son has never known you as anything but sick. So what I'd like to hear from people is how sarcoidosis impact and changed your life. So what, what did you do differently? What were you unable to do? How did sarcoidosis invade and change your daily living? Yes. So for about, again, five years, I was really sick with the cough while they were trying to get it under control with prednisone and methotrexate and various things. And because of that, my son was five when I was diagnosed because of the cough, three because of the ear thing. Um, and so I was on all of these drugs. You know, prednisone is terrible. It kind of makes you really on edge and everything drives you a little bit crazy. And so I apologize to my child all the time. I used to call it my mean mommy drug because he would do something and I would get angry and then I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, right? Like that's terrible. So that's probably my least favorite thing about prednisone and all of this is that 
I, cause I'm very much of a chill person. Like I'm very relaxed. It takes a lot to make me angry or anything like that. And it was just terrible when I was on it, when, when he was really little. So I always apologize to him. Um, for those five years, I couldn't work as much as I do. Um, I work part-time and my job was so nice about it and so accommodating and just really, really wonderful to me. So I feel lucky that I worked at a place at Georgia Tech where I worked with people who really understood and helped, you know, helped me with all of that. So that was great. I now work full-time again, as you said, and I kind of almost have two full-time jobs, but um, which is great. And so I kind of feel now like after getting past those first five years where I just had all of the problems and was on those high doses. And then after, you know, getting past uh, bone loss and the cataract surgery and things like that, that were a manifestation of it. We, I feel like my life is pretty normal now. Once I got on leflunamide and got off of prednisone, I can take a pill a day. Right. And so I, I think now that it, maybe I'm more tired, but then sometimes I think, well, I had a kid and I have almost two full-time jobs. Maybe I'm just tired because <laughs> of everything that I do. Um, so I think, you know, I think now it's pretty good. I don't feel like I suffer a ton. I just kind of have to watch for flares and try to take care of them as soon as possible. And other than that, I think I'm pretty good day to day. Mm -hmm. Do you, the fatigue is something that it was a big problem for me and a lot of patients mentioned it. So how was the fatigue for you? You know, for a while it was really, really hard. Like I couldn't, you know, I couldn't walk 10 feet without having to stop and rest. Right. I mean, that's when it was really bad in my lungs too. Um, so that was a part of it, but I mean, truly for a while it was awful. Once I've been on the and, you know, kind of rejoining the real world, um, I, I definitely am still tired all the time, but I, you know, just kind of push through. I mean, there's certain things that if tired is all I'm living with, as opposed to everything that I was going through, uh, great. I can be tired and I'll make it work. Mm -hmm. Do you take naps? You know what? I've never been a napper. It's really hard for me to nap, but I do sleep a lot at night. Like I, I definitely need a full eight hours, if not like 10 and I can sleep 10 hours straight, you know? So I think that sometimes I do get extra sleep that I, you know, desperately need. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned cramping in your feet. Like you knew you had a flare coming on when you had cramping in your feet. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So it's so weird. It was one of those things that I had horrible cramps in my legs. And so this was before I had the bad cough. And it was to the extent that I went to the doctor about it. And they were like, well, here. And they gave me some medication that was supposed to make them not cramp, especially at night because it was waking me up. So that was terrible. And, and so I took that, it worked a little bit, not really. But then once I got diagnosed and I got the sarcoid under control, the cramps in my feet and legs went away. And I thought that's kind of weird. And, you know, since I've lived with this for so long, I've been in a lot of flares and I have figured out over time that my feet will start cramping before I even get my cough. And again, once I get the flare under control, the the cramps in my feet and legs go away. What's the connection? I have no idea. But um, but yeah, so it's always a signal to me. I mean, the cough is very distinctive anyway. If you have sarcoidosis, you know what it, that cough is compared to something else. But the cramps in my feet are 100% a dead giveaway. And it was weird because I found an online group at Facebook and somebody mentioned cramping in their feet. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have that. And it happens every time. And so many people responded that they really? had it too. Yeah. So I figured out it wasn't that uncommon, but I don't, doctors, I don't think even really know that that's the thing because I'm not sure most of us make the connection. Yeah, that's, well, that's one of the great things that maybe, you know, with the podcast, people will listen and, and they, you know, they can comment or email me or contact you or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, because you know, I mean, not that the cramping is compared to some of the other issues that we suffer with sarcoidosis. It's not that big a deal, but if it's a signal or just something we all have in common, you know, I just, yeah. uh, I, I just think it's interesting because it happens to me too. It does. Yeah. Um, and I always attributed it to the fact that I probably rode my bike too far that day or, you know, yeah. um, but, uh, but it could totally be 
sarcoidosis related. So now you build these devices for children. What is that? Right. So in my job at Georgia Tech, a lot of what I do is I will talk to clinicians or maybe shadow them and understand what problems are. And I'll give you an example of one of them. That's my favorite. Um, so I asked some doctors and nurses, I was like, if you could fix one thing, what would it be? And they all came back with something called IV infiltration. And so if you go to the doctor and you get an IV in your hand or, you know, wherever they put it in on you and kids, they put it all over. It's not just in the hand. Um, what can happen is if they miss the vein or the vein bursts, which happens a lot in kids and elderly because their veins are much weaker, um, or if the, the needle ends up popping through at some point, say because of movement, um, the, the liquid in the IV starts going then underneath your skin, wherever your IV is, as opposed to in the vein where it's supposed to go. So that's bad for two reasons. The first is the medication is not going where it's supposed to go. So that's not good. But the second thing is, is a lot of those drugs can be very caustic and they can eat away at the soft tissue of the area of the IV. So like skin, muscle, nerves, tendons, and those types of things. <clears throat> and when that happens, if this, if this goes on for an extended period of time, like multiple hours without it being caught, <clears throat> um, especially for infants, um, you're going to cause permanent scarring and damage to that child. And so that's terrible. And it can happen in adults too. Um, and the elderly, like I said, but I was like, so my background has been a lot of sensor development and I did a lot of things with like laser sensing and thermal imaging and all sorts of things like that. Um, and I was like, all right, we should be able to figure this out. Like this is not a hard problem to solve. So what we've ended up doing is creating a sensor that sits around the IV site. So you would have the IV here and the sensors just around the site. Okay. And the nurses told us, so right now the way they diagnose this is the nurses go around every 30 minutes to their patients and check the IV sites. Um, but sometimes when they're busy, they don't get to do that. <clears throat> and so that's when this happens. It also happens during surgery where the IV site might be covered with a sheet for the duration of the surgery. Um, and so those are when bad things happen. So they told us if we could di uh, diagnose it or find it, within 30 minutes of it happening, then that prevents all of the really bad things from happening. And we're like, all right, that's our goal. Okay. And so we collected data and did a little retrospective study and figured out that we were catching it two hours before a nurse was catching it in her 30 minute window. So we were catching it long before she did. Um, they did. And we, uh, and so we're really excited about it. So we're actually, I think, getting ready to do a, a real clinical trial, getting geared up for that to, you know, help it move along to market. So super exciting. And it's really fun to be able to do things that are going to help people. And again, especially kids. Um, but I have tons of examples if anyone wanted to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, so you're on the speaker bureau for the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. So you you go around and tell your story and I would assume tell other SARC patients, how to feel better about whatever's going on with them. And you, and you're also, um, along, uh, you, you are a fellow member of the patient advisory committee, uh, with me. And we, we sort of look at different things the foundation is doing and they're gracious enough to ask our opinion on stuff. Yep. Um, and so, um, when you go out and you speak, what do you, what do you talk about? What do you tell people? So I will tell them about my experiences. I mean, it kind of depends on what the audience is interested in or what kind of questions I get asked. But, you know, one thing I say is with ICANN, so I've been doing ICANN for probably eight years now working with them. That's how long they've been in existence. And I was doing that long before I did the Speakers Bureau or the Patient Advisory Council because um, the foundation hadn't started it back then. It only started a couple of years ago. And I wanted to join because I felt like, you know, I was asking kids to share their stories to help, you know, other people and to help industry understand them and regulators and people like that. And so I felt like, why wouldn't I do the same thing for myself? And that's the reason why I joined. And I think, you know, from there, um, we get sent surveys or questions and things. I'll do that. 
Um, and I also just like sharing, you know, parts of my story that might help somebody else in their journey and, you know, really helping somebody feel that they're not alone in this. What they're experiencing is not just individual for them. There are other people out there who are going through it. And I think that that's just, it, it helps. It's comforting to know that you're not alone because sometimes I think you can feel really alone when you have something that nobody else has even heard of. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can be scary and it's not fun to be sick and nobody understands what you're going through, what it's like to be on 80 milligrams of prednisone and have the moon face or have cataract surgery at 47. You know, it's, it, it's just crazy. So I, I really do it just to, you know, again, help people understand what it's like to be me, but also to relate to other people. And again, help them not feel like they're isolated in their journey. Yeah. I think, I, you know, that's, that's what I tell folks that the podcast is all about is, you know, I want, I want them to know that there's hope. And I would expect that when you were mired in that five years of high doses of prednisone, you thought you were never going to come out the other side. That is definitely true. And, you know, that's difficult. I mean, it. I am a generally like naturally happy person. You know, things don't really get to me. But Bert, during that time, I definitely was not. I definitely dealt with some depression. Uh, in hindsight, I recognize now what, what all I was going through. It's really, really difficult when you have no idea what's going on and even your doctors, to some degree, like here in Atlanta, the reason I went to the Cleveland Clinic is because my doctors here were like, you need to go see a specialist. Like, we can help you, but we can't really help you like you need to be helped. Um, it, you know, it's just, it's hard to go through for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to counseling? I did not. It was, you know, it was one of those things that truly it was more of an in hindsight, I got what was happening because even at the time when I would like cry at nothing, I felt like I was like, well, is this sark in my brain? Because it can go anywhere, right? Is it, you know, is something affecting me there? Or is it one of the medications I'm on? Or And I, so I just didn't really recognize it as depression in hindsight. I know that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was hard for me to accept the fact that I needed to go talk to somebody but it yeah. did help. I mean, just, just, you know, just sit down and, and have the person walk you through, you know, why you're feeling, you could sort of see when you say it out loud, that some of your feelings are irrational. Yeah. And then when you kind of say it yourself, you're like, God, yeah, okay. That's, you know, I'm making this stuff up <laughs> um, or I'm feeling worse about it than I should, uh, or I'm overreacting to a given situation. Uh, and when you can see it, you, you, I don't know, made me feel feel better about things. Yeah. So um, we got a couple of minutes left here. What would be your final message to put out there to SARC patients as they're trying to navigate their own course? Wow. I would say hang in there. Hopefully it's not going to be as bad as you think it is. You'll eventually find that treatment that works um, truly leflunamide was my miracle drug. So maybe that'll help somebody out there. Um, I think, you know, you're not alone. There are other people out there. Try to find some, it helps. I've found two people in Atlanta now, um, through the foundation for sarcoidosis research. And, you know, now I have lunches or dinners with them and it's just good to be able to talk to somebody. And so there are other people around, even if you don't know them yet, and maybe join something like FSR to, you know, to help you locate other people. It's, it really helped me to be able to find people like me. Definitely. So hang in there. <laughs> awesome. Leanne, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Like a zombie just feeding at stumble Thank you so much, Leanne, for sharing your story and for taking the time out of your amazingly busy and successful schedule uh, to share your story with us. And thank you for, for helping all of us by being a volunteer with FSR and being on the Speakers Bureau um, and, and also on the Patient Advisory Committee where we help 
the be the patient's voice when the board of directors is trying to make a decision on various things that have to happen with FSR and the treatment of sarcoidosis. I want to remind everybody the official Sark Fighter song is called Zombie by Mark Steyer and his band, the White Hot Lizards. Mark's a fellow Sark Fighter. You can hear it back in episode 12, the, the story behind those lyrics. We release the Sark Fighter podcast every other Monday. And once again, as I am speaking today, my trusty boxer Dougal is curled up in the chair in my little studio here. Dougal makes my life so much better. Don't forget to follow Sark Fighter on social media, including Facebook and Instagram. I'm even on Peloton as Sark Fighter if you work out on the Peloton. And also my cycling blog called Carlin the Cyclist does have a section called Cycling with Sarcoidosis. The backstory to the founding of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson, husband and wife, Andrea, has sarcoidosis, and they started the organization at their kitchen table over 20 years ago. If you're new here and you just want to know what sarcoidosis is, listen to Episode 2 with Dr. Simon Hart. My story is Episode 1, tell you all about how sarcoidosis showed up in my life. And if you are interested in the podcast or if you just like it or don't like it, Send me an email, carlinagency at gmail.com. There's a link in the show notes. Also, follow the Sark Fighter, as I said, on Instagram and Facebook. I appreciate your interest in the Sark Fighter podcast. It helps me reach more people and grow the show if you share it on your social media. So if you like the FSR Sark Fighter podcast, share it. Or better yet, just tell one other person about it. It really helps helps us all spread the word and do more good and help raise the uh, image, uh, not the image, but the, the knowledge that sarcoidosis exists. If we can tell more people in the medical community that sarcoidosis is out here and that good people are sharing their stories and doing research and volunteering and making it all work. Until next time, keep fighting. Learn to suffer. Someday you learn endurance, your strength will fade away. Dead men walking, trying to keep up the pace. Dead men walking.